Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Kelly Broughton. I am the Assistant Dean for Research and Education here at University Libraries, and I have the very proud task of welcoming you all to uh, the Libraries Interna International Week event. Um, first, I want to thank a few people. Get that out of the way. First of all, um, a special thanks to Padilla Paladroy Shane Fawn. This was her idea from Center for International Studies. She, it was her idea to bring Nancy Tingley to Athens to talk about her books and share her insights and experiences uh, for, of her travels and working in Southeast Asia. Uh, thanks more generally to Dr. Lorna Jean Edmonds from Center for International Studies for their support in coordinating Nancy's travel. People from Ohio University Libraries, Jen Harvey, our events coordinator, Kate Mason does our promotions, Robin Kravesti does our facilities work, and they all have lots of wonderful student employees working for them. And of course, special thanks to the Ohio University Press, not only for being Nancy Tingley's publisher and uh, ushering the great intellectual and creative endeavors onto the page for us to enjoy, but also for being our longtime partner in the Authors at Alden event. And um, that goes all the way back to 2011. Okay, so let me introduce our special guests. First of all, uh, this is Nancy Tingley, who comes to us today from California. She's the author of Ohio University Press's Jenna Murphy Mystery Series. Besides being a mystery author, Nancy is an independent art historian and consultant with a specialty in Asian art. Her scholarship has earned her a profile in The New Yorker relating to a groundbreaking Vietnamese art exhibit she curated for the Asia Society in New York City. Her knowledge of art and culture of Southeast Asia are the perfect background for a mystery series featuring a young curator who finds herself drawn into art-related murder mysteries. Library Journal calls Jenna Murphy a fresh new voice and the first book of the series was a finalist for Left Coast Crime's Best Debut Mystery Award. Nancy is being interviewed today by our own Ohio University's Dr. Marion Lee, an associate professor in art history in the Art Plus Design Program in the College of Fine Arts. Um, Dr. Lee's research specialty is focused on late imperial China and contemporary art. And not only is Dr. Lee the ideal person to discuss Nancy's mysteries with us today, we learned that their paths has crossed decades ago while PhD students at UC Berkeley both worked together at, an, at the art, Asian Art Museum in San Francisco. Um, and so it was a great pleasure to learn that this event um, could bring them together so we can witness their reunion. Please join me um, in thanking them and welcoming them. Thank you, Kelly, for the introduction and thanking all for, um, for sort of all the work and effort behind this. I would like to reinforce the curatorial experiences and importance of Nancy as a curator in museums and as, a, as the curator of the historic 2010 exhibition, Art of Ancient Vietnam from River Plain to Open Sea, that was held at the Asia, Art, Asia Society in New York and the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. And Nancy, also has been and is the advisor, key advisor to serious collectors in the Bay Area, elsewhere in this country and elsewhere in the world. Now, a caveat. I am afraid I am uninformed in the cultures and arts of Southeast Asia. Um, including Bali and Cambodia, the subjects of the two books. I work in China and East Asian art, so I'm, I'm sort of uninformed. That said, it has been delightful and reassuring for an art historian to read the two books for the core and implicit attention paid to seeing, thinking, along with understanding as knowledge and information. Now, let's begin. Nancy, what is the genesis? Could you tell us the genesis? Oh. 
of the two books? Um, well, I've written fiction for years, uh, not doing anything with it, I fear. It's, I have a whole uh, cabinet that's filled with uh, either unfinished or finished manuscripts that I've you know, not really done anything with. And uh, it was only about five or six years ago that I was going to Bali, where I hadn't been for a number of years, and I was trying to find a mystery set in Bali. I'd read a couple things, but I couldn't find any more. And I thought, well, this is ridiculous. Two and a half million tourists go to Bali every year, and there isn't a mystery set there? That, I guess I'll write one. So um, that was really how I came to, to write mysteries. I'd, I'd read a lot of mysteries and in fact it was a big joke at the museum. I was a, working at the Asian Art Museum uh, when I was working, also working on my dissertation and uh, they, get, they threw me a party when, were you there then? You yeah, may have been I'm there. there. Um, they threw me a party when I finally finished my dissertation and they gave me a pile of mysteries that was about this high because I apparently had been cl complaining for months that I hadn't had any time to, read. to actually read something <laughs> other than a scholarly book and I couldn't wait until that, you know, that blasted uh, PhD had been filed. Um, in fact, before I actually wrote the PhD, I wrote a science fiction book. That was the first book that I wrote. It was terrible. <laughs> um, I don't even know that I still have a copy. Uh, I'm just hearing my own phone making noises at me, so I think I'm going to turn that off. Um, so that's how, that's how the books came about, but I think that, um, that it, uh, I, and I debated in the beginning, what should I make my protagonist? I mean, you know, that's the big issue. What, what should your protagonist be? Um, I went through various possibilities. I thought about a travel agent for quite a mm -hmm. per period of time, and then I thought, well, that's a little bit crazy because I don't really know anything about being a travel agent. And in this internet age, travel agents don't quite have the same, you know, uh, position that they had in the past. And uh, ultimately, I thought, well, I should write what I know, and uh -huh. that's, that's being a curator. And I also, the more I thought about it, the more that I thought that a, an art historian, more than any other, I would say, and maybe somebody in the audience would want to argue with me, more than any other um, sort of research academic profession is probably the one that's closest to being a detective because there's that visual component. You see, I can't even sit on this stage without having pictures <laughs> flashed behind me. I've got to have, you know, as an art historian, there, there have to be some pictures. I don't intend to talk about them. They're just uh, photographs I took in Cambodia and Bali, but, but I need them to be there um, because the visual is such a critical part of being an art historian. And in fact, I brought a prop to, to, to go through the, the process of um, of, of the art historian as compared to the detective. I don't know if any of you can see this little head here that I have, and because you can't see it from here, I'll, I'll let you pass it around. And I, I, I would encourage you all to really touch it and to feel the carving, feel what the carving feels like of the eyes and the nose mm -hmm. and everything, and talk about it a little bit. Um, say somebody brings that to me in a museum, which mm -hmm. is something that happens all the time. People bring in objects. Uh, they want them authenticated. They say, my grandmother had this for, a you know, got this 100 years ago, and it's from Japan. And you look at it, and you think, no, I don't think it's from Japan. But there's a process that you have to go through. And in the 80s, a group of sculptures at, like this one turned up in the art market and were uh, we all were, I mean, we had to go through the process of figuring out where they came mm -hmm. from. And um, it's made of, the first thing that we had to do was figure out what it was made from. It's made from tuff, which is a volcanic stone, not tufa, which is a limestone. And t that narrowed down the field of where it would be from. It had to be from the ring of fire, right? I mean, it has to, if it's Asian, we're pretty sure it's Asian, it has to be from one of the countries where the 450 volcanoes lie. Um, Indonesia is the likeliest. It doesn't look particularly mm -hmm. East Asian. You would yeah, yeah, probably yeah. agree with that. Yeah. Um, it does have the look of something South or Southeast Asian. And uh, then you're narrowed down to 
Indonesia, just like a detective trying to identify mm. his victim, you know, from the very beginning. So the identification is important. Where in Indonesia? It's made of stone. There are two islands in Indo I mean, there are there are, are two islands in Indonesia where somewhat realistic-looking stone sculptures are mm -hmm. produced: Java and Bali. So that narrows it down to that. Um, so I have a sense of where it's from. I want to date it. Mm -hmm. uh, as part of the identification process. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, an art historian would like to have a dated monument, a dated painting, a dated sculpture with an actual <laughs> date written on it for comparison's <laughs> sake. I don't have anything like that because it's a random piece that's been handed to me in a museum context. And so I have to look for stylistic comparisons. Um, I look at uh, temples, uh, mm -hmm. carvings on temples, and what comes to mind for me immediately are the carvings of Eastern Javanese temples, the bas-reliefs that are on the exterior of those temples, as well as terracottas that have been found at one specific site in Eastern Java called Trawulan, which was the um, capital of the the great um, seafaring Majapayat empire that ruled that region from the 13th to the 15th century. So now I know where it's from, but I've, I'm, my first love, I will admit, was Indonesian art, and I've never, still never seen anything like it, so I have to, I go back through all the old Dutch journals, the old research, I do the research, the book work, and I do find some photographs of pieces like this. Not that many, but I do find some photographs. So now I have, I can at least say something like this actually exists. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going through the same process, I think, that in many ways that a detective does, the visual part of it. The detective is looking for clues, just as I'm looking for clues, but in a visual way, not just in research as a historian might do or a, um, a literary person mm -hmm. might do. Mm -hmm. um, now I, ha I have my date, but is it authentic? <laughs> and that's why I, I ask you when you hold it to, mm -hmm. to run your finger along the nose, the carving of the nose, the carving around the eyes. Because an old piece has experienced some kind of wear, unless it's been inside a temple, which mm -hmm. is unlikely because this doesn't look like a, necessarily like a god. There'll be little chips all along the edge of the carving. There'll be discoloration to the piece. You would never have a neck like this one that's cut so perfectly. You know, this is a, this is a block of stone, it seems to me, that was carved. But um, did everybody get, oh, I think the people in front of you didn't get a chance yet. Let's see. Um, and so, um, the only thing I can really do is to go to Java and see if I can actually see these in museums, which is what I did in, in the 1980s. I, I went to Eastern Java and visited the museum in Trawalan and on the shelves in their storage, which they, were kind, they kindly let me go into, um, there were multiple ver types of this type of, of carving. Um, you know, here we had a whole body of material, as I say, that had turned up in the art market that we didn't didn't know much about. And um, so they're around, they exist, it's conceivable somebody dug some of them out of the ground and sold them illegally in the art, art market or whatever. Um, or they've been floating around in a private collection in the Netherlands for the past mm -hmm. hundred years. Mm -hmm. You know, there are all these possibilities mm -hmm. where they could have come from. Uh, but I really couldn't go any farther in the research than to say, yes, these existed, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this particular one I bought in East Java for $50 from the man who made it. So I mm -hmm. knew, I, this is my baseline piece, I knew that this piece was new. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, there's a kind of wacky um, test that had been done on some stone pieces in Singapore, right around the same time that I was going through this where they had taken some sculptures and they had put them in an MRI. <laughs> Does anybody have a clue why they would do that? Because uh, recently carved pieces still have the filings from the metal 
that oh. carved it. Uh -huh. So we took four, four pieces, this one that we knew was a fake, and three others, one that we thought might be a fake, two that we thought were probably authentic. Uh -huh. And we happened to have a patron at the Asian Art Museum who was a doctor at Kaiser in <laughs> California, and he arranged for us to put them through the MRI. And I know this sounds very kind of Marin County, but um, two of them had an aura around them, um, this one and the other one that we thought were a fake because of the metal filings oh. that were on the surface. So it, okay. it, it showed up differently in the uh -huh. picture, so we were able, able to resolve it. That may be a long way of saying, uh, the, you know, telling you the process of what an art historian uh -huh. goes through, but I think that it's so similar to yeah. what a detective does in yeah. finding all these yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. clues and figuring yeah. out all these different yeah. steps. Now, to sort of um, continue with forgeries, have you ever come across items that, say, a part of, a part of it was genuine? but a part of it wasn't? Um, actually, in Vietnam in particular, uh, there is a thriving art market for Dong Sun uh, bronzes. Oh, okay. And um, I worked with a private collector in uh -huh. Chicago uh -huh. who has purchased many um, Dong Sun uh, pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, many of which I thought were problematic. It's mm. a very difficult thing to say to somebody, this is a fake. They don't like it. And um, so I suggested that maybe the thing that we should do mm -hmm. is get some mm -hmm. scientific testing mm -hmm. done. Mm -hmm. And so Tom Chase, who okay. is, Marion knows, he's a very famous conservator who worked at the Smithsonian Institute and worked on all of their, mm -hmm. their bronzes, um, is retired now. Mm -hmm. And he came and another scientist and we got all this equipment and x-ray machines and everything <laughs> and we put all these things through the uh -huh. x-ray machine, which we could do with bronzes, uh -huh. and it, it was shocking to us because <laughs> There were four of us working on this, uh -huh. and we'd say, well, this one looks pretty good, and we'd put it in the machine, and then we'd all stand there and go, oh my god, this is terrifying, because there'd be a piece of a, a vessel, say, this uh -huh. size, piece like this that was right, and the rest of it was Whoa. reconstructed, and you couldn't even tell. So, yes, I have. When did they start doing that for the Dong Song films? Oh, that's so yeah, okay. interesting. Now, to come back, you mentioned that um, Bali, the book on Bali, you mentioned that, but that's the second. That's the second one, yeah. Right, okay. So, so did you work on a death in Bali first, or? I did work on a death in Bali first, but okay. then I ended up beginning with Cambodia. Okay, okay. And, and that, is that why they came out in relatively rapid Succession, it's like pretty one. common for uh, mysteries in series to come out one one a year. Oh, okay. So okay. that's that's pretty com yeah. common. Okay. Now, um, just a comment. I, I, your your observations of collectors being self-absorbed mm -hmm. and somewhat addicted. <laughs> so <laughs> interesting. Now, um, I I just. Now, okay, so these books in length, they are around 300 pages. I think one book is, what, 312, and the other one is like 330 or something. Mm -hmm. Yet the times covered in each of the book is about, what, three weeks to a month. I think a little bit less in A Death in Bali. I so think. that's about two weeks, to say. Maybe even 10 days, yeah, something 10 like days, that. right. A lot of actions take place in this book. I mean, moving around and like travel, like fast, um, uh, sort of fast um, geographical areas cover too. How to begin and, and, and what, what's really um, delightful is that how you used places and spaces both to create atmosphere and also as a way to 
as a strategy, if you will, to structure the frenetic pace in this book. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I can't say that that's necessarily a conscious thing. Oh. I think the I think the use of place is mm -hmm. is very conscious. Mm -hmm. I'm I like to travel, mm -hmm. and I'm somebody who used to have a half a suitcase filled with books and then that much space for the clothes. <laughs> uh, now I have my Kindle and I can take you know many more books. Uh, but I like to when I'm traveling I like uh -huh. to read uh, books that take place uh -huh. in whatever country or city or uh -huh. wherever I am. And uh -huh. I, I read and not so much for the facts that they. Right. They give me, although there's some some writers like Linda Fairstein who writes about uh, New York. I quite I quite like the facts that she throws out, and I'm always pleased to walk down the street and say, "Oh, that building was in that book I just finished." Uh -huh. But um, I think of place as character, and I think in particular, uh, I I would like people to um, read these books either. I mean, I, travelers to read them and to get something mm -hmm. from them, to mm -hmm. have, for there to be some content, and mm -hmm. armchair travelers to experience the ambiance of place. Uh -huh. And I think that, uh, you know, aside from the grander place of uh -huh. Cambodia, uh -huh. um, uh, for those of you who, I'm, I don't know if any of you have read it, but in, in the, the first book, Ahead, of, Ahead in Cambodia, uh, Jenna takes a group to, uh, of patrons from the museum to visit temples. And so it, it gives me an opportunity to include um, various of the temples um, uh -huh. in the book. Um, but I think, uh, I, I can't say that I actually use place to structure it. I use place to, to give a sense of setting. And because I think it's really important to do that. I'm reading a book, I'm reading a mystery right now. I was at a, Mystery Writers Conference last week, um, where there were 700 people, 500 of them were readers, people who, who are mystery fans. I didn't even know there was such a thing, you know, until, <laughs> until this. Um, and uh, there are a lot of books given away, and I picked up this one book that um, is not, that I wasn't picking up so much for myself, but for a friend who's writing a historical mystery. It takes place in 1799. And I have to tell you that uh, for me, the late um, 18th century will always be this book because he's, he so perfectly evokes what New York City must have been like then in terms of the uh, uh, spatially mm -hmm, as well mm -hmm. as the smells and the mm -hmm. sounds. Mm -hmm. and, the, um, and um, I think from that book, that's what's going to stay with me. So I hope some of that stays with people from my books. Now, to, to sort of go back to the two books, in some of the scenes sort of that, took, that take place in temples and shrines, sometimes you mention a specific, sort of something specific, whether the, the, the appearance of a Buddhist statue or the action of some one or two persons that are there. How do you make decisions? I mean, you know, say, okay, for this place, I will use this. I'm, I'm sorry, it sounds really- It doesn't really... happen like that. It does, so you know, how does it- write. <laughs> <laughs> You get up at five in the morning, you sit down at your computer and you start writing. I mean, I, but of course, writing is writing. The first draft is uh -huh. simple compared uh -huh. to revising. Uh -huh. it's, I mean, in that sense, it's not different from scholarly writing, where you're constant. You know, you have to rework and rework, and sometimes throw things out and uh -huh. pile things on. And uh, it, it, it's the same in that way. And yeah. Uh, okay. How do you know when to stop? in writing a specific, say, a specific scene or specific event that takes place? Um, well, I suppose in the same way that you know when you're writing a, an article when you, yeah. you've said enough. And sometimes you don't. You have an editor going, what, what are you doing here? You know, <laughs> toss this out. Um, I think, um, you know, one of the things that's, well, 
it's extremely liberating writing fiction when you've written nonfiction, uh -huh. obviously, because you can make anything up. Yeah, but you can and make you things up. <laughs> Sorry, you go ahead. You can't do it in the same way when you're writing nonfiction. I mean, I can't make everything up, right. obviously, because there's always going to be some fact checker, checker who's going to come along and say, um, you know, the the uh, Bayonne was not built at that time, or uh -huh. the Bakong is, is uh, you know, an ugly temple, or, uh -huh. I mean, I don't know, you know, whatever they, they might think, but, um, but you, have a, you have a freedom that you don't have in writing nonfiction. Yes, you make things up, but they have to be logical and they have to stick together, mm -hmm. which is, which in academic writing doesn't, is sort of, how should I say, it's more, it has a greater degree of anchoring. Am I making sense? Sorry. That makes sense, yeah, I can see that. Um, so you're asking me how I anchor, I don't, that's, I can't answer that, I don't think. Um, I mean, when you, as I say, you're constantly revising, so uh -huh. some of that doesn't work the first time around. So yeah. maybe by the eighth time around it works. I've been writing a thriller and then, you know, every time I go back to it I, I make some change. Or the third book in the series um, that takes place in Vietnam. Um, I, going over it and over uh -huh. it. And every time somebody reads it they say something different than the person <laughs> who read it right before that. So, um, you know, so it's a constant uh, reworking and possibly digging in your heels and saying this is I'm keeping this because this for me is is what it is uh -huh. it works for me so you rework both the writing the lines as well as the whole plot and sure. storyline sure okay because you do figure out it's not, I mean there are points when you go oh my god I I didn't talk about this person earlier uh -huh. or uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. I didn't say that he was six feet tall. I said he was four feet tall here, and now I've got him six feet tall, and I've got to change that, and okay. you know all of those things. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you be, you become more uh, aware of what you've written as you with each writing. Yeah. Um. Now I, and another point that that's that's delightful is that. that of the scenes, about the scenes that take place in temples. It's like how the way you are able to engage with different times in a temple. Different times? You yes. Mean? The time in which the temple was built and the time in which all the art was made and the, the time that takes place. Mm -hmm in the book, in the story. I mean, that's very, I mean, that's also difficult. Maybe, but I've always said that I, I really don't go past the 15th century. You know, you get uh -huh. any later than that and I have some trouble. So I think I feel, um, I feel that when I'm, when I'm writing, I, I've been to Southeast Asia so many times, mm -hmm. and I've been to these temples so mm -hmm. many times. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've studied them and I've experienced them. Mm -hmm. And um, I, for me, going there feels like going home. Oh, okay. So it, feel, yeah. it just feels very natural and sort of part of part of uh -huh. you know part of my life, or maybe in a past way. Um, okay. So you are so. Yes, so, so you feel sort of saturated mm -hmm. in these temples. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. I mean, I've been asked by people, you know, how much research do you do? Mm -hmm. And for this book, there wasn't, because I've gone many times and I've gone to the temples over and over, mm -hmm. there wasn't a lot of research I had to do. The thing that did come up, has, has come up for me with the books, um, is the fact that, as I say, I really, I don't go past the 15th century, you know, when you get <laughs> much closer to modernity than, yeah. than that, I have a little bit of trouble, but uh -huh. um, is that I realized that I couldn't write ahead in Cambodia without 
thinking a lot about the, Paul, the Khmer Rouge and right. Pol Pot and, uh, and the effect that mm -hmm. that, that had. Mm -hmm. So um, in many ways, I was sort of yanked into the, mm -hmm. into the 20th century mm -hmm. by, by the writing um, in a way that I, I mean, not that I had ignored it or I wasn't aware of right. it. It was just that I had to think about how does this, um, how does this fit in the context of the book? Um, just like the, actually the the book that I'm the next one that comes uh -huh. out in Vietnam. Uh -huh. I, um, my ex my personal experience because I first went to Vietnam in 1988 uh, was very much about the war because there were not a lot of other Americans there and and the war was very was still very much mm -hmm. there even mm -hmm. though it was you know 13 years mm -hmm. after after mm -hmm. it ended. So mm -hmm. um, something about the war had to be in the book. Uh, mm. But the current daily lives um, in Bali and parts of Cambodia are so, you know, so grounded, it sort of permeate both books, that to hear you say that you wouldn't go past beyond the 15th century <laughs> is a shock. Because, I mean, that's, that's the wonderful thing, is that for me, the storyline and, and the details, they sort of straddle these different time zones and these different cultural zones. But I think that's my, ex that's my experience. It's because okay. I haven't, I've never lived in these countries for, for years at a time. Mm -hmm. I've always gone as a, as a museum person, mm -hmm. as, a, as an academic, mm -hmm. as a, you know, on a fellowship, mm -hmm. as a doing that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. so, um, in many ways, writing that writing a, her experience mm -hmm. in the same way makes mm -hmm. the most sense because that's just how I've experienced it. So, okay. um, even though I mean, one question that I get is uh, people ask how much of of Jenna is you? You know, how how much are you the same? In fact, I I think I may have told you this story earlier. I have a a friend who lives in in Vietnam. I don't know her very well. I know her a little bit. And she said to me, um, oh, you're so much like Jenna. I thought, well, I don't really think that I am. But she then said, uh, she said, you know, are you still riding, riding your bike a lot? And I said, I'm not a bike rider, <laughs> um, which Jenna is in yeah. the book. And, yeah, and yeah, she yeah. said, what? <laughs> sure you are. I said, Sorry, <laughs> you know, I hate to disappoint yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and other friends who are mm -hmm. bike riders who mm -hmm. said, "How did you get that one scene?" You know, when yeah, she goes yeah. down, when is she? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That yeah. Um, she goes down on her bike. Right. How did you get that if you're not yeah. a bike rider? Yeah. I said, "Well, you know, I imagined it. I mean, that's what I'm doing. I'm writing fiction. That's why they call it mm -hmm. that." <laughs> uh, so, um, and I think if you're uh, you know, I'm one of those people who at a party sits in one corner of the room and looks, watches what everybody's <laughs> doing. So I think if you're, you're an observer, that's, yeah. that's what you end up with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, yeah. Can I ask a sure. Um, wait, wait, wait. Sorry. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. We're recording. Is loud We're enough. recording, so we would like you to use the microphone. Oh, I'll come I over see. there. That's oh, why. I see. That's why. <laughs> Nancy, I just wanted to ask you whether the process of writing, whether finishing your, your first book, I know you had done a lot of writing before then, mm -hmm. but whether it changed you at all as a writer, the way you approached it, do you feel that your, the second book in this Jenna series uh, reflects some changes that you made in your approach in any way? Um, I was wondering if you could talk about kind of the process of writing and whether mm -hmm. your experience of completing one impacted your approach on the second? Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm somebody who's pretty focused, and I also am a morning person, and so I get up very early in the morning and I start writing, and that hasn't changed, and I could never write at night, and I don't know how people do it, but that's the difference between a night person and a daytime person. So I, um, I would say that, um, there's, a, there's something they talk about in, for writers. Are, are you a, a plotter or a pantser? Or do you go by the seat of your pants or do you plot? And um, I think that at, with time I plot a little bit more. 
Um, I, I've realized the advantage. I mean, I, I never was a pantser, but I, I think I um, develop my characters mm -hmm. in advance mm -hmm. a bit more mm -hmm. and maybe have a, a, a little bit better outline. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned that I, I've been writing a thriller, and the reason that I did that was because I have a short story that just came out in an anthology this month, and it's a short story that sort of starts off like a thriller, and I thought, oh, maybe this, that is a, you know, has a sort of suspense thriller feel to it, and I thought, well, maybe I can turn this into a book, and so I did NaNoWriMo. Does anybody know what NaNoWriMo is? National November Writing Month, and that means that in the month of November, you commit, although you're basically committing to yourself, you commit to writing 50,000 words in a month, which is quite a bit. Um, and uh, so I committed to doing that with using this short story. And I will say that I had a pretty clear um, plot. My, my mm -hmm. outline was, mm -hmm. was very clear, because I knew I couldn't write 50,000 words in a month mm -hmm. if, uh, without, a, without a pretty clear outline. Mm -hmm. um, and I wrote 60. So Whoa. you know, I, I got the, the basis of a book done in that time. But, um, so I, I think. One thing that I will say I think has changed, I think I'm getting better at revising. I think it was harder for me to revise at first than it is, than it is now. And revising, I mean, you, you can revise 15 times, mm -hmm. you know, 20 mm -hmm. times. Mm -hmm. uh, you can go through and read it for this gram grammatical error, for <laughs> this character, for that character, for, I mean, there are so many ways you can read, it, read yeah. a book that, uh, and you still end up with mistakes that somebody else is going to catch. Do you always keep the outline that now? Oh, stick to yeah, it. Yeah, stick to it. No, actually, um, well, more or less, but I, I think that's the, one of the things that I have learned that's so mm -hmm. different with, fic with fiction mm -hmm. is that characters have minds of their own, and writers say this over and over again. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying anything new, but um, for instance, in A Head in Cambodia, there's a uh, she takes this group of patrons to, um, to Cambodia. And I had a specific idea for this group in the beginning. And mm -hmm. I, you've read them, so you know that um, they're kind of a disparate group. Yeah. And when it starts off, you think, oh, uh oh, this is going to be trouble. And, right. But they did things that I didn't yeah. expect them to do. Mm -hmm. And um, by the end, they had come together in right. a way that I hadn't anticipated, and which, I really, which was one of my favorite things about the book. Was, was the fact that they, uh, of what they did and, and the direction that they took without me telling them to. No. Okay, so in a sense, they, as you said, they have minds of their own. Yeah, the, I mean, sometimes a character does something and you, get, and once they've done it, then you, of course, you have to go in that direction when you'd <laughs> intended on going in, the, in this direction, so. Okay. Any other questions? Is there anything particular about Southeast Asia after all these years that lends itself so well to mysteries? I mean, is, is it something about Southeast Asia that for you, it makes it a more compelling place or an easier way for you to, to write a mystery in that setting? Than writing it, say here, you mean? Here, or like uh -huh. you said, this, this summer you were in, in Europe. Uh, right. Um, in some ways, yes, and I think it's, um, it may be in part the fact that each country in Southeast Asia is so unique. I mean, as Southeast Asianists, we, we of course, um, look at the group of things that, that makes it, that unifies it to some degree, whether it's the uh, houses on stilts or it's the, the bellows type of, you know, the, the list that, uh, Anthony Reed put together and other people have put together of what makes Southeast Asia a unified region. Um, there's that, but at the same time, I mean, Bali is not like, it's not even like Java, you know, I mean, whether they're in the same country, or Vietnam is, is so different from Cambodia. And um, I, that's like, a, it's like a treasure trove, really, mm -hmm. for somebody who's writing a, a series like this mm -hmm. set in Southeast Asia, because each mm -hmm. book um, can be a bit different. 
And uh, people always say, will often ask me, you know, what's your favorite country in Southeast Asia? And I mean, I can't answer that question. Mm -hmm. I mean, I also I can't answer a question. I'm not very good with favorites. People say, what's your favorite book? What's your favorite <laughs> mystery? And I just think, how can, I can't do the password thing, you know, when it says, what's your, what's your favorite car? I mean, <laughs> what? <laughs> what's your favorite book? I mean, how could anybody ever at answer that? I just, it's incomprehensible to me, so. Um, so there's a richness to it that, mm -hmm. that is wonderful. And I think also the fact that, I, as I say, I'm a traveler, and I like to, I, I, I love being able to mm -hmm. write about these, these places that, mm -hmm. are, that have such a rich culture. Mm -hmm. And I like the idea of people reading them who don't know anything about it. That, I really like that. That's, that's great. I, I met um, uh, this one, this man bought, um, a Death in Bali, hadn't read ahead in Cambodia, bought it at a literary festival where I had books, where I did a reading. And um, he said, well, I married an Indonesian and we haven't been back since we got married, but we got married in Bali and that's why I want to read it. And I got emails from him, like, he was a slow reader. I think, no, I think he was somebody who just didn't read a lot, and he was so excited about this book, he sent me an email every week saying, oh my gosh, I really like this, and oh my gosh, this reminded me of a meal my wife and I had, and you know, I mean, it was just, it was yeah. so sweet and charming, and I mean, it, I, I thought, wow, I've got a fan. But aside, <laughs> aside from having a fan, I also felt like, you know, I've, I, in some yeah. tiny, tiny way, have enriched this person's life. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to ask about some, uh, I'm trying to form the question now, but I wanted to ask you generally about forgers and oh, forgers. your opinion on the, the business of forgery. My sense is that from an art historian perspective, they're pretty evil. But on the other hand, I mean, there's, I wonder about like a grudging respect um, for the craft, the effort. And mm -hmm. I wonder also, some people might be very canny and clever about getting it into the art market, where some people might be just trying to make a living and knowing that there's a tourist sort of way of surviving. Um, and then lastly, is, is forgery more of a problem today in the contemporary art world scene than it was, say, in you know, the 18th century or something? Um. A forgery in Southeast Asia is a, is a is big business. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if any of you have been to Bangkok, but in Bangkok there is a, a, this huge complex called River City that's filled with antiques. <laughs> and um, I would say when I first went there, probably in uh, in the early 80s, there were antiques there. Mm -hmm. Today, I would say if there if five percent of the <coughs> the objects being sold are old. I would be a little bit surprised. Um, so uh, that said, I, I do have a grudging respect for people who mm -hmm. make these beautiful things mm -hmm. uh, and that can only sell them if they pretend that they're old. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a wonderful, I, I had a, f a fellowship, uh, a grant, a fellowship to go to Thailand for a couple months in the um, I guess it must have been um, 87, and because I hadn't spent a lot of time in Thailand, and uh, I, one of the things I wanted to do was to to mm -hmm. look at fakes, and mm -hmm. so I was taken by this horrible, <laughs> evil dealer to um, to this forger's house, and. Um, uh, this man was, he was so good. I mean, he mm -hmm. was really brilliant. Mm -hmm. uh, and I then subsequently saw a, a sculpture that he made that wasn't in ancient style, it was contemporary style. I mean, it was, it was heartbreaking that he mm -hmm. was, was forced into this, mm -hmm. s this, mm -hmm. so, yeah, uh, that's the case. Now, wait a second, I've, I've forgotten at least one part of your. Well, I just wondered if you 
you encounter things as an art historian that you can say, oh, this was a forgery, but it was done in 1750? There's a group of um, Thai sculptures that are in, that's in, there are a number of pieces in different museums. There's one at Brooklyn Museum. There's one at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Um, I, I'm not sure where all the rest of them are, but um, they're, they were made in the 30s. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an art historian who uh, sort of tracked them down and figured out that, that one person was making them and that, that they're in these various places. Uh, well, I mean, we, we figured out there were four of us that used to go around to museums and look mm -hmm. in the storage and tell them what was fake, mm -hmm. um, which was really interesting, uh, you know, all the, all the big museums, so that was, that was pretty interesting. But um, it's, it's a really funny thing when you think about it, mm -hmm. that, that it, uh, you know, that it's, that it's bad because it's a good old, old you know, yeah. a good fake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's evil, but interesting. Yeah. That's why it's not always a good idea to go to, um, to see collections of, to see private collections private or public collections. Well, it's not a good, it's, it's, as I say, it's, it's, you get shot, you yeah. know, you're the messenger, yeah. nobody yeah. really wants, they say, yeah. I want, you know, I want you to authenticate yeah. this, and then you say, I'm sorry, it's wrong. Yeah, right. They don't want to hear that. Yeah. Um, so it's, it really is a, not a very comfortable position to be in. Um, this is just one comment. The um, Toledo Art Museum once did a great exhibit on forgeries. Uh -huh. Everything yes. that they had yes. um, were um, things that had been bought in error, things they had found out about, and with the story. It was uh. great. It was really fascinating. So I just the other setting for the book um, is the museum. You've created the Seoul Museum, and uh, you know I think that all of the behind-the-scenes stuff yeah. um, at the museum is a very interesting part of the book. Um, can you tell me a little more about how you sort of created Seoul, what, what it's based on, and... Um, uh, well, as has been said, I worked at the Asian Art Museum. I was the curator of Southeast Asian art there for a number of years. And then I've worked as a consultant at other museums. I consulted for many years the Crocker Art Museum in Sacramento. I've done some consulting for Brooklyn. I've done, you know, a number of museums, uh, done, worked with them on collections. Um, one of the th interesting things about museums is that it's a business, really, and it's run by academics and artists. And I don't know that I need to say more than that for you to <laughs> have a sense of uh, some of the dysfunction that occurs in, in, in many museums. Uh, and I think anyone who works in a museum would probably agree with that. So it really is uh, rich with possibility of uh, things that could happen um, among, uh, between staff peoples. and. Um, as Marion said, I mean, I've met some really wonderful mm -hmm. collectors, people who are passionate mm -hmm. about the type of art that they collect and knowledgeable and mm -hmm. brilliant. And then I've met some other people, some people who are collectors um, because they're addicted. I mean, it really is an addiction. Mm -hmm. um, it's retail therapy to the nth degree. <laughs> and um, uh, so that's another another part of the mm -hmm. museum world that, mm -hmm. that's interesting. I mean, one thing I should say, I, I should, there should be a disclaimer probably at the beginning of each of the books saying, <laughs> um, you know, people are not as bad as they, they seem in this. <laughs> and um, I haven't met any murderers. Um, I have in, in my professional, I, I've met forgers. I have met forgers. I've met dealers who mm -hmm. I wouldn't, you know, I would walk a mile out of the way to avoid. Um, but uh, in general, most of the people mm -hmm. that I've dealt with in my professional life have, you know, in, that are involved in art are, the, are involved because they're passionate about it. They mm -hmm. just, you know, it's, I mean, what, what can be better than walking into a museum and seeing some fabulous work of art? It just makes your heart stop. Um, so, and it's certainly true of, the um, museum, I mean, the museum in Bangkok. Or, I mean, museum, all these museums in these countries. There's so many great works of art. That, 
I, I'll tell you one funny thing. Well, it's not really funny. It's kind of sad. When I first became a curator, people would say to me, like, I was a rock star. <gasps> You're a curator. <laughs> You know, did you have that happen to you? You know, it, it, I mean, this was just a really exciting profession to be. Mm -hmm. Today, in the present time, mm -hmm. a couple of years ago, somebody said to me, oh, you were a curator. Um, did you steal things? <laughs> <laughs> so that's a really interesting yeah. shift in the perception yeah. of the art market yeah. in, in, you know, from the 80s into yeah. contemporary times. Yeah. Um, and I hope that I'm not helping to perpetuate this new view of, of the art world. Right. But, um, uh, you know, Indiana Jones and all various other, I guess, public, I don't know what, I, you know, there's a lot in the press about stolen art and uh, repatriating things. And it's a very complex, mm -hmm. uh, really complicated issue yeah. in all kinds of levels, having to do with national laws and mm -hmm who's selling the art and who's buying the art. and I mean, it's so complicated, it, it's not going to get unraveled soon. Were there any other questions? I have a question. Yes? You talked um, some about, a lot about, how your art history expertise and your work as a curator has influenced your fiction. Has your fiction writing influenced your work there in art history, in the museum? I retired. So no, not at all. I'm not doing it, no. Now when people ask, I mean, I was asked last yeah. year to do a big project to work yeah. on a, a catalog um, mm -hmm. of a big Hong Kong collection. Uh -huh. And I yeah, said, I, I said, no. <laughs> well, in part because they showed, I mean, I was tempted. Mm -hmm. I will admit to being tempted. Mm -hmm. Um, but they showed me the pictures of yeah. the collection, and I yeah. saw at least one thing that I wasn't sure of, and I thought, I'm just not going to go there. I just, you know, I, I don't, this is not going to go over well if I say this is a fake. Mm -hmm. um, so. mm -hmm. I have another question for you then. You like to read about the places that you're traveling. How do you pick which book you're going to read when you're traveling to a new place? Um, I... Uh, well, now I go online. I go, you know, I go to bookstores. Mm -hmm. I, I'm late. I'm, I'm going to Italy next month, and I've been online looking up a lot. That's been the main thing that I've been doing. What are you looking for? Um, mysteries, fiction of any kind. Um, it's surprising how little fiction takes place in Italy. I mean, you know, if you've read all your Henry James and all of that stuff already, you're, you kind of you start running out. I mean, you've read your Donna Leon in, in Venice if you want to read mysteries, or your Michael Dibkin in, in Rome. Um, so it, it's, not, it's surprising that there isn't more, given the way people travel. But maybe people don't read when they, when they travel. I don't know. Does it, what, what, is it, what do other people do? Is that what other, are other people like me that they have to have like a, a library of books with them or they start <laughs> shaking? You know? I, I was telling Marion earlier that in, in Vietnam and, and Alec that in Vietnam one time I ran out of books. And this was really traumatic. I had to, the only book that was available to me was a Danielle Steele. <laughs> It was traumatic. <laughs> I can tell you, it was really not good. Well, thank. I, I want to thank everybody for having me here. It's been really nice, and um, I hope I get to talk with a few people uh, afterwards. So, thanks so much. Like before we close up and thank our lovely guests, I'd like to encourage everyone to stop by the little professor's table and uh, buy a book be a great travel book. <laughs> Thank you. Join me in Thanks. thanking our special guest. Thank you.